Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the third Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on June 18th, 2023. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 19, verses 2 through 8a. Our alternative first reading and our continuous is Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 15, or um, you can include verses 20, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. The psalm is the 100th psalm. Our second reading uh, is Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 8. And our gospel this week is from the gospel of Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through chapter 10, verse 8. But you can also continue reading verses 9 through 23. So a lot of text to work with this week on this Father's Day. Yeah, and a lot there in Matthew. It, the, this is the sending of the 12, except he never really sends them. He gives a speech. It's like, <laughs> it's the, the missionary discourse in Matthew where, you know, you get some, you get, you're all excited, but then it, it never concludes with, and then they went out. <laughs> it's, it's, I just, I kind of imagine him talking to them and they all kind of like gradually one at a time, just like slip away. Like we're going to start now while Jesus is still <laughs> going on about things, but but you know, this is a. It's Matthew is a gospel deeply concerned about the church. It actually, is the only gospel that uses that language in 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 some places. But it's. Um, but in a, of course, this commissioning applies more broadly. I think the way Matthew sets this up, right? This is what everybody should expect, in terms of what to preach, but also how to preach it, and then the risk that attends that 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 preaching and living. Is it preaching or is it proclamation, though? That's my question. Recently, in a discussion with a couple of Lutherans about that. Oh yes, uh huh, yeah. Mm. I will say, uh, I I really appreciated um, uh, Cleo Larue's commentary. The images that he shifts uh, for helping us to understand um, what's actually uh, being, uh, who's actually being sent here. Um, uh, and the line that I I highlighted is that. They must be people sent by God, not people who are self-appointed, because the harvest is God's harvest, and God is its Lord. Um, I, I really appreciated uh, that reminder for us, and as well oh. as the imagery which he gives us. Yeah, and that, that sense of, you know, the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few, and that this the 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 necessariness of being sent or the necessariness of the apostles yes. uh, and and uh, just a little tidbit here that the the names of the twelve apostles this is the only time in Matthew that they're actually called the sent ones the apostles and so which I thought you know. I mean, in the light of eternity, that's not going to preach, but, um, <laughs> but, but it's an interesting way to emphasize what, what the disciple, the, who the disciples are and why God, why Jesus calls the disciples, that they're not just followers. They're not just students. Uh, they're not just learners, but they're this, these sent ones and how important that is. And, um, uh, I was doing, when I was doing my prep for this, one of the I was reading um, Warren Carter's uh, some of his uh, commentary on on this section, and if you go through twenty three, if you go all the way through twenty three, what what ends up being maybe something to explore with the with this missionary discourse is that there's four aspects of mission here as. The arena, what is, where is it? Where is it going to be? What are the tasks going to be in chapter, in verses seven and eight? What kind of support might the disciples imagine in eight through 10? And what is the impact of this, of this mission going to be in, the, in verses 11 to 15? And that might be something that a preacher might, uh, might imagine or like recontextualize 
in in their own setting of what is what is the arena for this congregation what are the what are the tasks that this congregation is called to uh, carry out what kind of support uh, do we do we have here and then what is going to be the impact what what difference does this make why is this going to happen uh, and that it matters so that's maybe one one direction you could take following along with that there's this sensitivity of Jesus to the need. Um, he has compassion on them because they're harassed and helpless. And he sends out the disciples recognizing that the result of them doing exactly what they're called to do is going to result in them being harassed and feeling helpless. And there's a, a, a continuity with that as well as, as, as we think of how this story has been set up. And by that, I mean how we've talked in the weeks past about how the whole story of God's action in earth, uh, on earth or in human history from creation to new creation is this sense of a repeating chaos being created beautiful. And until Christ returns, we're gonna have that repetition. And so that's exactly what we have in this text. Jesus sees, their need, Jesus sends and acknowledges your being there. You're doing exactly what you're called to do. It's not going to mean everything's going to be cozy. It's going to get complicated. Be ready for that. Yeah, these <clears throat> these kinds of texts often sneak up on us in the season after Pentecost, or where you've, you've gone through um, the Easter season and, and the beginning of Pentecost, and it's a lot of a lot of positivity. I mean, occasionally you'll get a story like the stoning of Stephen during Easter or something like that. But then here's this, it, especially at the end, if you go on to verse 23, I mean, verses you know, 19 through 23 are incredibly bleak in terms of the world that Jesus imagines and the, 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 the activity of discipleship, the reality of discipleship is not just about rejection and pain. It's just, it's about um, the structures that we rely upon falling apart, <laughs> families turning on each other, uh, those types of things uh, <laughs> and things such as those, uh, you know, it's um, what, and so, uh, you know, on a, on a lovely Sunday morning in the, in, in the middle of June, what do you do with that? And so I think it's, <clears throat> it's something we have to, certainly anchor in the first century and say this spoke to churches that were believers who were undergoing exactly this kind of a breakdown. But this also is something about how Jesus imagines the conflict at the heart of, and the church has done, of course, some Christ, individual Christians have done some horrible things with that throughout history in terms of making Christian faith deliberately adversarial or a, a conqueror's faith. But just to kind of talk about what is that like? Like what what is it about the gospel that might still be offensive? And it might still be if it's different things today than it was then, I'm sure. And not that you go out and seek out ways to be offensive, but just to kind of keep pushing that question. I mentioned this last week. Why do they kill him in the end? Here the question might be, why are people so mad at the church in this future that Jesus imagines? Um and maybe the world's gotten safer and more tolerant since then, at least for some people with privilege. And that's great. I don't want to pretend that, um, that things don't improve in the world, but there's a call to discipleship here. That is, that honestly just terrifies me. <laughs> if I'm being perfectly honest, and it would be good for a congregation to, to talk about that. Maybe. I, I appreciate that, Matt. And particularly you're saying ground this in the first century. Because this is a place where what I say to our students is let the text do the heavy lifting. Because if you really center this in the bleakness that you've just described, if you really center this in you're offering good news and this is how you're going to be treated. This is how folks are going to respond. If you set that in the reality of the first century, people can't miss that that's a relevant living word today. 
um, you, 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 you end it, Matt, by saying, you know, the, not your exact word, but the idea, the cost of discipleship for us. Um, there's, there needs to be that recognition that what Jesus is saying then is a word to us today. But let the text speak it with all of its harshness and with all of its promise then so that people realize I'm not just picking and choosing a text that works for us now, because when we get to do that on something that is our agenda, that's when we destroy God's word. And this is a perfect place, I think, for people to see how relevant the gospel is. And we can say a lot more about divisions. We can say a lot more about persecution by staying with what Jesus is speaking of rather than making the application uh, randomly today. Thank you for that. Yeah. yeah very Thank helpful. you. Mm -hmm. Exodus. Well, another commissioning yep. <laughs> of sorts. Mm -hmm. But I like this one better. This one, <laughs> well, this one there's, a similar, there's a similar bleakness to it. Um, uh, what, I, what I note uh, with this text is how quickly the people said, absolutely, and how slowly the people acted. There's, you know, it's like, you know, everything, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And as we've already uh, discussed as, as we've uh, in weeks previous and, and other texts, people seem to be slow in doing exactly what God has asked us to do. Mm -hmm. And here we even agree to do it. So I, I find this another bleak text. <laughs> yeah. And, but it, I think it's also, I think it's also not, not to put a, you know, a rosy, uh, you know, no, get us out, get me out of this. <laughs> not to make it all roses, but this, I, I think that, you know, when we look at the Matthew text too, and, and what you mentioned, Joy, in terms of um, that, the, the G, God is the Lord of the harvest, right? Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And that here you have a similar kind of, uh, of promise, right? That, uh, that uh, the whole earth is mine. And so it, it, there's this underlying assumption, right, that that whatever we're going into, God is present in that. And God is, you know, and you get the language of I bore you up on eagle's wings and the, you know, the continuity of God's steadfastness and fulfillment, fulfillment of God's promises. Not that that's going necessarily going to, that God's presence doesn't prevent those hardships and those challenges, but God is there in the midst of them. And, uh, and, and it, it's interesting that when I was doing the research again on this, like going back to Matthew, but the spirit of your father speaking through you, that's the only time that, uh, it, that there's a reference to this disciples having the spirit. So sometimes it means like you have to look for, I mean, in these moments of standing up for the kingdom of God, standing up for righteousness, standing up for what God what God is doing in the world, sometimes it's really hard to see where God is present in that. Uh, and that's in part what these texts tell me that, you know, what do you fall back on? What promises do you fall back on? What promises of God lift you up? Uh, and in these moments where you are putting yourself out there and saying, this is the God whom I know, uh, and with certain rejection and certain, uh, you know, and, and certain harassment. <laughs> um, so that's some thoughts. I appreciate, I, I appreciate, uh, the episodic thread that you just did there, Caroline, because, um, I was I, episodic thread. That's exactly what I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> you did. I I often, you know, try to thread all the way back to uh, to the Old Testament and bring it all the way to to the New. You just did a shorter uh, episodic thread in noting the spirit uh, 
Um, we're just a few weeks off of Trinity Sunday, right? Where we talked about, you know, and 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 we're in the season of Pentecost, where we where this is the Spirit being mentioned. The only time that the Spirit is being mentioned, but it's a reminder that our capacity to do this is because of the Lord of the harvest being present because of the faithfulness of God doing what God alone can do. So thank you for that episodic link. You're welcome. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> we want to I, to I, hate, I hate asking this um, because you definitely have done precisely what we need to do whenever we're, we're it, it, engaging in a text like this. And that's to be able to to make the move from what is um, what is the complication or what is the crisis to what is the promise and where is the peace. But um, I, I, I didn't mention this, and I want to just say this. Someone might want to use that. Um, as I was reading the commentary on Exodus, it made me consider how commitments of previous generations that have not been lived out um, leave present generations um, with the same questions. So that yes, that wasn't lived out um, re results in complications for how do we live out that faithfulness today? Good. Genesis? Yeah, lift me out of this again, because I brought oh, us no, down. No, no. So <laughs> Here we are continuing our Genesis run. Yeah. And I I I um I I just preached on this and um uh are prepared to will be preaching on this and uh I um I I asked it would we laugh? Um it it's you know Sarah in here says I laugh, I laugh. Um and you know, this sort of goes on the other side of the question I asked last week. What what makes God laugh? What how are we laughing at God? And here, would we laugh? Um, God has made an absolutely astounding promise that they haven't received, that they've been waiting for, um, that they've been having twists and tur turns along this journey. Where, okay, that was a great promise. It got us to go and. When I mean we're just getting older and and deader, you know, uh, and so here they they make the promise again, and yeah, right. I don't know if I can believe that now. That that's one way. That's one way of leaning into this text. What would what would, would we laugh? And and the the, the question is, would we la do we laugh at the promises of God? I also. Oh, go ahead, Matt. No, I was going to say, I, I would, <clears throat> I would laugh at this one because it, it, it is ludicrous from, yeah. from her perspective. So I also would uh, call people, people's attention, preachers attention to the commentary on the website by um, uh, Carolyn Hessel, uh, that, and the way in which she talks about how this text might land on uh, listeners who uh, particularly struggle with infertility and, um, and you know what is it? What is it? What does it mean to uh, to not have that promise, or to not? Um, how do you how do you how do you deal with that? Those kinds of challenges, and um, and it, yeah. So I just I thought it was really well done too, um, because these kinds of uh, you know yeah we could laugh at it, and then and yet at the same time how much um, how much pain. Uh, and sadness and hopelessness that reality is for so many um, people. And so I just. Yeah, I, I totally appreciate uh, that, uh, Caroline. Um, it's interesting that this text falls uh, on Father's Day uh, because I'm often encouraging uh, preachers to remember at Mother's Day as we celebrate motherhood to remember those mothers, um, th those folks for whom um, motherhood was not their identity, um, and 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 Caroline, this this is your first Father's Day without your dad. Um, as we remember that barrenness for women and the burden 
there's also a recognition for men who want to be fathers. And like 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 um, Abram thought they had this promise and it's not going to be. I mean, this isn't just something that women carry. Um, so be attentive to that uh, as well, uh, as we are attentive to what any holiday of this sort means for people who have just experienced loss as you have. Thanks, both of you, for that. I mean, it's so important with this text. It's it's like a healing story mm -hmm. that makes healing look way too simple or <clears throat> makes people who aren't healed feel like they somehow deserve it. And this is it has a similar dynamic, I think, and if it's not um, tended well. I want to go back to the laughter as well and the um, the idea that like, what do we do with a text like this? And, you know, it sets up so much that's really important for Genesis, but I don't want to hear a sermon that's just setting the stage for future <laughs> sermons, right? And so, I, and some of this comes out of my work with the Book of Acts, which is a book full of weird stories and sometimes disturbing stories, and we don't always quite know what to make of it. And when, when I encounter that, I wonder, like, maybe the author's just trying to be funny here. Like, maybe there's maybe the response to this is as is, is much humor as it is awe. And it's hard to read Genesis that way because everybody's so old and serious and the stakes are so high. But maybe there's something about this story that's supposed to be a little bit goofy. I mean, Abraham's running all over the place trying to like, you know, be welcoming to these strangers who have just shown up, who turn out to be a manifestation of God, you know, and... um and the the promise is so weird and strange and you can imagine sarah uh overhearing and you know this is a trope in so much right the men are talking serious business and she's way more aware than anybody else is they're talking about my reproductive system out there and they're idiots you know and she's laughing maybe there's something about it that's just kind of a at the end, we're just supposed to laugh hysterically about a God who provides a way out of no way. Like maybe the story isn't as serious as we sometimes want it to be. Not, I don't mean that to gloss over what we were talking about regarding infertility or anything else, but one way of getting into this is to, is to have some fun with it, perhaps. Well, yeah. Or it, recognize it opens, it's supposed to be absurd. It opens up, as you said, Matt, Abraham is giddy. <laughs> Well, in verse, I think verse 15, it'd be a great place, but you know, Sarah and I said, I did not laugh. He said, oh yes, you did. No, I didn't. Oh yes, you did. I heard you. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. Yes, you did. And then let's point out too, where it jumps ahead to chapter 21, Sarah actually gets to speak and it's not Sarah speaking hatred toward Hagar and Ishmael. You know what I mean? This is a place where we, we get a brief glimpse into something of Sarah's own wonder and, and, and delight and gratitude. So um, in, in light of the, how it's a story about Abraham and his three male visitors <laughs> here, it's this reminder that like, oh yeah, I guess Sarah does have a role in this as well. And, and in that theme of laughter, hear the joy in her statement, I've born a son. In my yeah, there's different ways of laughing age. at things, aren't there? In my Sometimes laughing is cruel. Yeah. 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 So. And maybe that is a good connection to the song. Oh, yeah. yes. that That's exactly it. This is a God who likes noise. Yes. I've, I've gotten in trouble with congregations where I've done the children's sermon. And when this is the psalm, uh, I'll bring a, a a big, one of those big gift bags, one of those oversized gift bags that just has balloons and is bright multicolored and says celebration or something like that on it. And I fill it with noisemakers oh. and I give it to the children. And you watch all the parents freak parents out. Are <laughs> what are you doing? And I do it because in the middle of the sermon, I'm going to ask the children to make noise. So there'll be some setup where I say, when I say this, I want you to play this. I want you to play it loud. And it's just a reminder. This is a great piece. God loves noise, joyful noise. We'll talk about lamenting noise at another time, but 
God likes a joyful noise. And I think this psalm just gives, uh, it, it gives words and voice to what we've just said. I mean, what, what are the response, what is the response to, uh, to the absurd absurdity of what God does sometimes and, um, and making that joyful noise. So the way in which you could bring this psalm into, I think, uh, a lot of the directions we've gone in these texts, I think would be the way I would go with the psalm or sing it, just sing it. <laughs> well, and also with texts, old 100th. Uh, yeah. When yeah. some of these texts as well, that have got the bleakness in Matthew, the, uh, the idea of a, of a community uh, that's being commissioned in Exodus and being told who it's, a, who it is and what it's supposed to do that one of the responses of being God's people is hardship <laughs> or struggle, but here's also delight, which again, even the Genesis text picks up on that, right? That here is, um, the, the way of God's people is never easy or even pleasant or attractive <laughs> throughout most of scripture, uh, but it's joyful in the midst of that. Which you could use it liturgically, which people do all the time in some churches, by the way. Yeah, comes out of our mouth very often, huh? There's also, I, I see a sense where that can connect to the positive side of each of uh, the ends here in Romans, where the absurdity of God's promise um, is what the chaos produces. That's the promise. So in suffering endurance and endurance character, and in character, hope. And that hope doesn't dis disappoint because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Reading reading uh, verses three through seven, uh, six, uh, excuse me, three through five, I can't count here. Um, not, um, and I hope you'll say something about this. You've done this before, uh, Matt, not for us to glorify the suffering and not even particularly not to make this some type of, uh, of pattern that we have to go through, um, that, you know, we're, we're looking for this in order to get this product, but rather to see it as a promise that in the reality of harassment, in the reality of helplessness, I'm going back to the Matthew text, in the reality of uh, being persecuted, God still makes the promise that sent us out in the first place, that caused us to say yes to follow, that caused us to drop everything and go, that will make us laugh because the promise is as absurd to us, that endurance, that not disappointing, that hope. I, I, I see that as a, a, a link for this Romans text. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um... And yeah, I'm not a big fan of suffering. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, I don't see it as redemptive, but I recognize um, it's transformative for a lot of people in particular ways. Um, yeah, I, so much of what we're talking about today, there's some big picture things here. And the book of Romans, obviously, Paul has got this, you know, this theological vision he is imparting or reflecting on with the, the Roman churches. And a lot of the first three chapters, even the chapter four, makes it almost kind of sound like a problem to solve. And a lot of people read Romans that way. And what I love about this, like chapter five, verse one, is this big turning point, uh, and which will then set up what he's going to do in the next four chapters. But don't miss chapter verse eight either. God proves God's love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, it's not it's, this, is, this is not a theological explanation of a problem that has to be solved. It's also a love story for Paul. And we can lose sight of that because, you know, he's going to start talking about enslavement to sin. And I mean, it just gets heavy and hard to follow. But here's a point where we were reminded that for Paul, if he only gets one word to describe the cross of Christ, I think it's love for him that he sees this as an act of divine love, which we might otherwise miss because of all the <laughs> complexity. And that's a place where you can anchor a sermon and, and again, not to explain love, who can do that, but to insist on it, that God's love is somehow demonstrated 
in what God does. I think too, another theme that I hear in this is, um, is, and connecting some of the directions that we've gone is the emphasis on hope in this section of, of Romans that, and the way in which, if, when you read through Romans, the way in which, as Paul's trying to work all this out you know, through a different, you know, different ways that like, and especially like nine to 11 of, 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 of the relationship between um, the, you know, the Jews and the Gentiles, that how important hope ends up being, you know, grounding uh, this hope in God. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. Boast can also be translated there, uh, rejoice, that we rejoice in hope. And, uh, and when you think about how, uh, how that hope is connected to, you know, expectation of children, being able to have children and, uh, but, but with the power of hope and what hope ends up, um, ends up being and doing for when you are in, um, suffering or when you're in travail or when you're in, um, you know, the situation of the disciples, what is it about hope that carries you through or carries you in the midst of, I think, uh, would also be, um, would all, and hope does not disappoint us. Um, and so that could be, I think, another really fruitful homiletical direction, depending on your context of, of grounding the experience and the capacity to hope in God's love, as you said, uh, Matt, and, and what is the power of hope in these circumstances that, uh, for all intents and purposes, seems absent of it.